presentation is on law, and we're just looking at a basic definition. We'll go through the uh, basic components of this definition so that we can then apply this to the various types of law that we'll look at in the next video um, and in the moral life in general. <clears throat> so, a law is defined by Thomas Aquinas as an ordinance of reason directed to the common good, formulated by a competent authority, which is promulgated. As you can see, I've taken um, the entire sentence, which is the definition, and broken it out into the four main components, which we will look at in the forthcoming slides. The first thing is that a law is an ordinance of reason. Uh, this can be seen as an essential definition. If I were to ask you what is law, the most um, basic and simple answer would be it's an ordinance of reason. What do we mean by ordinance? We mean, essentially, it's a, it's a rule. It's um, a measure of action, specifically. It's used for uh, the two components or the two ways in which a rule or a law is used. Is It's, it's used to judge past actions. <laughs> but it's also used to teach future actions. Um, so law can be something that judges the past, which is typically used in trial law, criminal law, um, for violations of law. But it's also used to teach. Um, law is a teacher which um, kind of asks us, essentially, to act in a certain way. When something is forbidden, it teaches us not to do something. When something is allowed to happen, it kind of teaches us to embrace it as okay. Um, and so that's essentially what it means for a law to be reasonable. Uh, law, first and foremost, should come from reason, meaning a law should recognize um, human action and its fulfillment. The human person is directed by reason to the fulfillment of our being. We've talked about the purpose of the human person being happiness, ultimate fulfillment. And so reason is nothing other than recognizing that fulfillment and then directing all of our actions to that fulfillment, which means along the way, certain actions are going to be conducive to that, helpful to that, and certain actions will not be, which means by our reason, we will naturally not do certain things and we will naturally do other things. Uh, so in a sense, we're kind of uh, creating a law for ourselves. But when we create a law in general that should be followed, it should come from reason. It should recognize human action and fulfillment. And that's the basis of law. At the same time, a law is reasonable because it appeals to reason. So law not only um, recognizes that um, humans desire what is good and law should be something that aids us in, in fulfilling that good, but law appeals to human reason, meaning it doesn't necessarily force or bind us. It, um, it simply is there for man to understand and to act accordingly. Um, the example that I would give is a stop sign. All right, so those of you who drive. Uh, you come up to an intersection that has a stop sign. The law, which is symbolized by the stop sign, tells us we're supposed to stop. That's the law. But it doesn't force us to stop. In fact, I actually have to choose to stop. Um, I could choose not to stop, and thus I break the law. Uh, but I could choose to stop and abide by the law. And so in that instance, what the law is doing is not forcing me to do anything. Um, it's not making me do anything. It's, it's not necessarily um, intrinsic to my nature. It's not natural for me to just stop on a whim. Um, it's, it's, that law is appealing to my, my reason. And through my reason, then, I recognize the symbol, the stop sign, which is symbolizing the law that I should stop at this intersection for reasons of safety. And then I choose to act in accord with that law. And so for a law to be an ordinance of reason really means two things. One, it comes from reason, meaning when we formulate law, we should have good, reasonable principles for formulating these laws. But at the same time, law appeals to human reason. Um, the prohibition to murder does not actually force you to not kill someone. The prohibition to murder actually appeals to your reason and tries to get you to choose to not kill someone. Um, if law forced us to abide by it, then no one would ever break the law. But people break the law all the time because law appeals to the human reason. It appeals to our reason that we might choose to live in accordance with it. So law appeals to reason um, essentially means that we get to choose to abide by it. 
um, but it does not force us. Um, we don't always act in accordance with it. Second, the law is directed to the common good. Um, this might be described as the final causation, meaning the purpose. What is the purpose of law? Law has one purpose, the common good. All right? And that's important because the primary pur purpose of law is the good of the community, not the private citizen. Um, while we can have specific laws later on and when we talk about human law uh, that governs particular individual rights and things like that, uh, first and foremost, law is directed to the common good, all right? So the good of the community as a whole, all right? Not a majority within the community, not a minority, uh, not just a select few, not the individual. Uh, it's directed towards the community as a whole, as a body. Um, and so, because we as human beings live in community, we are social beings, right? But you also have to remember this, this must be based upon the basic definition, the essential definition of an, of, a, of an ordinance of reason, right? Remember, reason recognizes our ultimate end, which is perfect happiness, and directs us to that, right? So if a law is reasonable and directed to the common good, it recognizes that the common good of everyone in the community is perfect happiness, Every human person, as we talked about in, in the purpose of humanity, in ultimate fulfillment, in happiness, every human purpose ha every human person has the same ultimate goal, perfect happiness. And so law is directed to that. Right? That's the purpose of law, not limiting our freedom. It's so that every person in the community, so that the community as a whole can seek their ultimate end, that is perfect happiness. That's the primary purpose of law. Thirdly, a law is formulated by a competent authority. All right? This gets at the efficient cause, meaning where does law come from? Who creates law? All right, so this gets at the creator of the law. And there are two basic options uh, as formulated by Aquinas, which can easily be applied to essentially, if you want to use the examples of our um, national government styles, um, the laws come from either the people governed by the laws or the persons legitimately governing those people. So in our instance, you have kind of a democracy, a republic, so to speak, in which, yeah, the people are kind of in charge, but we have elected officials. Uh, you might look back to the Greeks to have more of a pure democracy, a demos, where the people govern uh, and they create their own laws by uh, popular votes. Uh, we have that hybrid between uh, a Roman Republic and a, uh, a Greek democracy. Or you can have something like uh, a monarchy, um, uh, a complete authoritarian uh, um, leader who formulates all the laws which govern the people. Um, no matter what, um, the, the person formulating the law needs to be a competent authority, right? Um, I'm the competent authority in my classroom, and so um, if I create a law in my classroom that is reasonable and directed to the common good, well, it's my classroom. I can do that. Um, I'm the competent authority in that classroom. I can't make a law about how students should act in another teacher's classroom, right? I'm not the competent authority there, right? Um, just like the governor of Ohio could not create an executive order about how things should happen in Indiana, He's not the competent authority in Indiana. He's only the competent authority in Ohio. Um, and so it must be that there's a competent authority who formulates this law. Otherwise, the law would simply not be binding. Um, and so that competent authority can be either the people who are governed by the law, so they can come up with this law for themselves, or someone who is legitimately governing of that people. And finally, the law is promulgated. What does this mean? It simply means that people know about it. Uh, it's communicated. Uh, when our legislature here in the United States creates a law, that's all well and good, and then it's enforced by the executive branch and interpreted by the judicial branch, that's all well and good, but we have to know about it. We have to understand that law exists. And if we don't know that that law exists, how can we be held responsible when we break it? All right. Um, and so this kind of gets at... Um, um, you see a practical application of uh, one of the criteria for mortal sin. Right? You have to know it's grave matter. Um, well, if you don't know it's grave matter, then it's, it's not a mortal sin. Well, you have to know there's a law against something so that when you 
potentially choose to do something, you know whether it's right or wrong, whether you should do this or not. So a law really cannot be effective as a rule or measure of action unless people actually know about the law. People don't know about it. The law doesn't work. And so a law could be reasonable. It could be directed to the common good. It can be formulated by a competent authority. But if it's not communicated to the people it governs, it's not an effective law. It's not a binding law.